What's up everybody, Rich Redmond here from the Jason Aldean Band. I'm here in Syracuse, New York today at Subcat Studios with my friends from Making Music Magazine. Um, hey, Rich, uh, thanks a lot for coming. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. We're happy to have you. This is Cassidy. Hey, how are you? So we were, uh, I was noticing on your website, I looked at your website, and you, you talk a lot about uh, positive attitudes sure. and so on. Tell us about this part right here. Passion is the engine, hard work is the fuel. Passion is your engine exactly. and hard work is your fuel. That's basically the, the hunger portion of my CRASH acronym. So CRASH is an acronym. It's easy to remember. stands for commitment, relationships, attitude, skill and hunger so all five of these things these tenants could be used separately but if you use them together you know you're going to be one powerful person you're going to be able to manifest the successful life that you want to have and believe me you're going to need every tool in your toolbox possible to be successful in the music business because it's a tough one but that comes from the hunger piece which is basically i tell people look at if you're passionate about something especially school kids i say look at if you're passionate about something that's your engine then you feed that engine you fuel that engine with hard work and the harder you work the luckier you get, the more opportunities that come to you. But since you're so passionate about it, it doesn't feel like work. So you work harder and more opportunities come to you and, and it's your, it's, you can guarantee success through hard work. Um, I was in a, a cool restaurant last night in Utica and I came out and right there and said, talent means nothing without hard work. You know, so a lot of people have a lot of raw talent, but unless you refine it and work on it and mold it, hard work's always gonna win. It's always gonna beat out raw talent. But if you have both, Rocking. Very good. Yeah. Your turn. All right. Um, so, Rich, what does music mean to you? I always tell people that music is like our one of our greatest gifts. It's like our highest form of expression. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I've been playing in the same band for twenty years. And so I tell everybody, hey, we're like Aquaman and the fish. It's like doo -doo -doo -doo. like we finish each other's sentences. You know, we we've been in each other's weddings. We've traveled the world together. And um, and we and we're just communicating on the highest level, and it's really awesome. Like uh, I love creative people. I love being in music, and I don't think I would do anything else with my life. It's been an amazing journey. So you do the drums obviously for this gig, but mm -hmm. you also uh, you do writing as well. Yeah. Tell us about that. You know, I've I've experienced the the highs and lows of the music business at every level, and I've also experimented with. Um, all the different facets and revenue streams and skill sets you can have in the music business. So, uh, you know, I've produced a couple number one records. I wrote a couple number one songs. I have three number one songs by, I don't know, I think a lot of people can say this, but I've had three number one songs with a Tasmanian pop country band called the Wolf Brothers. And if you want to look up their music, it's Wolf with, a si with an E, silent E. Great guys. Um, but they, uh, you know, they championed me, we, we, we liked each other, and I started writing songs with them, and they recorded like five of my songs, and three of them went to number one. So for about five years, I had a publishing deal in Nashville with Magic Mustang Publishing, and uh, you know, you were talking about our tour schedule. We basically get on a bus every Wednesday night, and we go take the music to the people Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and that leaves like 72 hours in Nashville to like play drums on other people's records, or produce, or write songs. So for five years, I chased that, that that songwriting skill set of like basically trying to write the same country music song that everybody's trying to write now, which is like Daisy Dukes and bonfires and parties and, and, and it's like retelling that same story over and over. And like, I'm from Connecticut, man. It's like, it was crazy. It was like a crazy skill set to have. And I chased it and it was a lot of fun. And I developed that and I scratched that itch. And now it's one of the many things I do, but I, I, I don't like make it a habit of doing it every day now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if somebody says, Rich, I want to write a song with you, I'm like, I never say no to someone. I'll be like, yeah, let's get creative. Let's, All right, I'll call you tomorrow. Let's get dirty. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I know. 
Um, you've mentioned in past interviews that you have an interest in playing in genres outside of country. Sure. Um, can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I basically tell everybody that I'm a, an overeducated rock drummer. I mean, my first album that I had was uh, Elton John's Greatest Hits Volume 1 on 8-track. Um, and then, and then you know, that started a love affair with Elton John's music, and I discovered Billy Joel, and then Mellencamp, and then, you know, the, my gateway drug to the music business was the Synchronicity record. When that came out, you know, the VJs on MTV, oh, Martha Quinn, J.J. Jackson, you know, I was like, Nina Blackwood, I was like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And then, uh, then Van Halen came out with 1984, and I was like, this, so basically I'm a rock drummer, but I just went and I, you know, I, I overeducated myself, I got a master's degree in like classical percussion and jazz, I played all different kinds of music, and uh, I just keep coming back to that. When I, when I'm, when I wake up in the morning, I'm a rock drummer, you know, I bring people's songs to life. And so I'm lucky that I found my, my Sting, my Bono, my Elton, my Billy Joel, and a guy named Jason Aldean who lets us just rock out. So he lets you collaborate? Uh, you, is, it, is it collaborative effort? Oh, it's very collaborative in the sense that it, it's, it's, a de it's a democratic process in the, in the sense that all of us, are, 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 our talents are welcomed. Like we've been in all the videos, we've played on all the records, we've played on every television show. It's about as close as you can actually get to a band, but it's Jason Aldean's name on the marquee, you know, just like a Billy Joel or a Mellencamp or an Elton John. So mm -hmm. I manifested into my life exactly what I wanted from a young age. It's like, I want to do that. So be careful what you wish for because you most likely you're going to get it, you know? <laughs> cool. That's cool. So you guys, even why his name is on the marquee, it's a band. It's it very, it's a, like it's, a it really does feel like a band. I mean, like I said, we finished each other's sentences and we've been playing together for, for 20 years. I mean, what is that, five presidencies or something like that? I mean, mm -hmm. hairstyles have come and gone, clothing styles have come and gone, wives, girlfriends. Hair's come and gone. It's, I'm serious. Like, we are still playing music together, so we're accountable to each other and it's a really fun situation. But um, in Nashville, uh, everything is very compartmentalized. You have the band, you have the, the recording band, the touring band, you have the artist, and then you have the songwriters. It's the songwriting capital of the world and all the greatest songwriters are there. So Aldean, he's very smart. He picks the greatest songs. And when you and, and it all starts with a song. If you have a great song, and then you have a great producer and a nice recording band to bring that to life, and then you can take a high energy band out to the people and entertain the people, he's hitting it on all sides, and that's why it's a successful model. It's, it's really very successful. It's really yes, fun. Indeed. Absolutely. Um, so, what's it like to hear a number one hit song um, on the radio and know that you know you're in it? That's pretty. It's pretty neat when you're in an elevator. When you're in an elevator, you know, or like you're picking up like some canned tomatoes in like a grocery store, and you're like, "Hey, that's me!" Or like when a soccer mom's like got her ringtone and she, it's like a song that you played on. It's like, <laughs> "Hey, hey, lady." <laughs> That's me. That's pretty cool. You know, it's a, it's a, that's why I tell all my students, I say, look, it always play from the heart. It'll set you apart and never mail anything in because the one time you mail something in, a performance, that's when some tastemaker is going to see you in the room and go, oh, it wasn't very good. You know, so you always have to play it for the best of your ability. And then when you're recording, it's forever. It really is. And I look back at, you know, we have a body of work now. We're are working on our ninth record. So when I look back into the first record and I go, wow, there's a lot of fire. I, I see what I was onto there. But but you always want to be improving, right? So I look back and I go, oh, my drum sounds have improved, this has improved, that has improved, and that's what we want. We always want to continually be improving, but I, I can still look back and be proud of those things. That was a, a record is a, is a moment in time that's captured forever. So if you just try to play the best of your ability at all times, you'll be okay. You know? yeah. If you had, if there was one fundamental that our drummer friends out there should uh, pay attention to that is most overlooked. You know, what do you see that, what, what's your big tip for those guys? Um, it, you know, drumming comes down to like time, groove, and feel, right? And everybody just wants to jump into the deep end of the pool right away and play extreme double bass and one-handed rolls and left foot clave and, and it's like, guys, you got to be able to play a beat and maintain that tempo for three and a half minutes and make it feel good and then have the discipline, the desire and the discipline to create a song and lift up that vocal and stay out of the way and make it an easy, smooth ride for everyone in the band. That's how drummers get hired over and over again. So make it less about the, you know, uh, the oodly oodly oodlies, you know what I mean? You know, save it for the save it for the drum solo. And even when you do your drum solo, most likely those people are going to the bathroom or they're going to get popcorn. They want to hear the song. So I just decided, like along the way, that I was going to be a song drummer. So if you can make it about being an, an accompanist 
and playing with a great feel, playing musically, have a musical mind, be a great collaborator, be, and then have your skill sets together, you know, like play, being able to play with or without a click and make it feel good and play with loops and maybe you can overdub percussion and maybe the ability to read music or create your own charts. Like if I didn't have the ability to read music or create my own charts, I, w I wouldn't have the body of work that I have because, you know, like in a, in a year like 1999, I was in 27 bands and the only way I could do that is because I could read music. I could pull out the charts and go, I, I haven't played with you guys in three months, but we're cool. I know the arrangement. It's right there. We'll run it down at soundcheck and they go, God, that guy's right. Boom, I got the right tempo, I got the right arrangement. And then as a result of all these people that I've met along the way, that led to me meeting the people that made a difference in my career, the Jason Aldeans, you know? Mm. So have your skill set together, but it's always gonna come down to your time, your feel, your groove, and your ability to make people feel good playing music. And then the listener dance, you know? When I was playing in top 40 bands, I always knew it was like, I, I was doing a good job if there was dancers on the floor. You know, and then uh, if we look out in the seats and people are bobbing their head and having a great time, I'm doing my job, you know. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so here we're going to, let's go to your book. Yeah. So, uh, oh, you have it right there. Of course. Okay. <laughs> so you wrote a book. Ta-da! Tell us about the book. Yeah, this is a, basically it's, a, it's called uh, Crash Course for Success. Five Ways to Supercharge Your Personal and Professional Life. And I self-published it. Um, so for any authors out there that want to like self-publish or want to get into the publishing game, this is the way to go. Um, it's available on Kindle, so it'll download on Amazon to any device. And then you can have it delivered to your front door in one to three days. And you keep almost all the money and you have the complete power to market yourself, you know, hundred percent, which I love. And right now, um, I studied voiceover. I do a little bit of voiceover. So I'm actually just got finished reading the audible version of the book, which will be coming out maybe like a, probably about a month or so, but I'm having the time of my life, you know, promoting this book and the concepts in it, um, are basically my crash concept for success, which is what I use. Um, it's like basically a mantra for successful living. It's a mantra for that people can use to navigate the music business, which is probably the most difficult business in the world to navigate. And then it's also the platform that I speak on when I speak to Fortune 100 companies, your Cisco's, your Hewlett Packard's, your Presidio's. I speak to like, you know, big pharma, um, startups, healthcare, education, uh, colleges. I'm having, I'm having a great time doing it. Yeah. So that's the companion to all of that. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we certainly thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. You've got to go to the sound check now. Yeah, is that it? I that's see it. more questions on there, man. Do you we, want me to ask you more questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to hold you up. No, that's all good. Uh, she asked that one. I'm really feeling that. Okay, I did that one. Okay, I got, I got one. Oh, okay, she's um, got one. So in, <laughs> so in live performance, obviously, um, things can go wrong. Mistakes sure. can happen. And yeah. Do you have any advice um, for players on how to kind of overcome that? Don't make mistakes. <laughs> Okay, That's after the first the mistake. We just no, blame the drummer. No, no, I mean, I mean, yeah, the drummer, it's like... Bass player. The drummer, like, everybody in the band has to be responsible for their performance for the time, right? Everyone is responsible for the time, but usually the drummer has to have the most informed, disciplined, highly developed sense of time. But, um, but like, I basically use over-preparation as a model in my life. So if somebody hires you, it is your job to over-prepare and know the material and then being able to execute that material and then do it every night. And I tell people, like, look at a, a recording drummer uh, records the song that he's never heard before, like he's played it a thousand times. And a live drummer plays a song that he's played a thousand times, like he's playing it for the first time. So if you can keep that mindset, you'll be so successful. But the, what I like to do is I just like to be a, a boy scout. Like, so I have a, another snare drum that's ready to go in case that snare drum breaks. I have another pedal ready to go. I have extra heads in case I go through a bass drum head. I got extra cymbals ready to go. So you almost have to kind of be like a boy scout or, or a girl scout in, 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 in terms of like preparation and being able to get around um, that Irishman, Murphy. Murphy's Law, man, because things will go wrong, and it's how you recover from those situations. So I'm just always over prepared. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Yes. Yeah. Two of everything. Great. Who did you learn from? Who are your influences? Well, I had a lot of great teachers along the way. I started um, drumming in 1976 when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and my first teacher was a guy named Jack Berkey at the Milford Percussion and Guitar Workshop. Great guys, taught me how to hold the sticks, got me going with some Joel Rothman books. 
And then when I moved to Texas, I joined the fifth grade band and I had great teachers there. I had a guy named Jim Hargrave and Ricky Malachi and Byron Mutnick and Larry White, all these guys from El Paso, Texas. And there's nothing to do in El Paso. I mean, we're talking like tumbleweeds are blowing through town. And it was just a great way to, to practice, you know. So I got my skill set together and then I ended up going to Texas Tech University. I studied with a great teacher named Alan Shin. And then when I got to University of North Texas, there are some amazing teachers there. Um, Ed Sof, he's a world-renowned educator. Ed Sof, Henry Oxtel, Robert Chitroma, uh, Ron Fink. I just had a great time. And um, as far as like big name guys, I just try to steal from all drummers. So uh, Nigel Olson with Elton John can play a ballad. He's the best ballad player. And then you've got Kenny Aronoff for energy. And then you have the grease factor with Charlie Watts. And then you have the, the maniacal... Uh, Keith Moon thing, and then and then great session drummers like Hal Blaine and Jeff Porcaro and John Robinson. And if you take all these things and you put them in a blender, hopefully you know we're all so unique. You know we're all like snowflakes. Find yourself. You just you you develop a thing, you know, and then hopefully that is a unique version of yourself. And then you refine it, and then maybe eventually you get to the point where people go, I like your drumming, and then you start influencing people, and it's just like you pass the baton. It's like a cool mm. thing. I just steal Very from well everyone. Said. Yeah. I just yeah. take from everyone. Like I'll take that. And then, toolbox, you know? Right. Yeah. I think it was Mozart that said, uh, great Good composers borrow. And the great ones steal. Great composers steal. Right. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. Right. Thanks now for having me, guys. Thank this you. is great. Yes, Have a great you. show. Pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.